Chu. I am chairman and co-founder of Anamoka Brands. It is a great pleasure to be here to discuss about the meaning and potential of the open metaverse. Very quickly, an introduction to Animoca Brands. The company basically really focused on building the open metaverse. Today, we have over 150 investments in everything related to NFTs and open metaverse, as well as constructing our own projects, such as the Sandbox, or Rev, or Gamey, or Tower, all of them basically contributing towards an open and shared Web3 space known as the metaverse. But let's quickly talk about what the metaverse is. In some ways, we have to thank Mark Zuckerberg for Facebook after they rebranded themselves to Meta. It basically put the term metaverse into everyone's lips. And now Microsoft and of course game companies and even you know companies like Dropbox are all talking about the metaverse. So what in fact is the metaverse? The metaverse can be defined in one of many ways. But I would say there's a distinction between what we can call the true metaverse versus what we consider a closed metaverse, which I'll go into later. But let's take a look at the state in which we are currently in. Most of us are already spending all this time online already, when you consider the number of people that are spending online, you know, 80% of them are online daily. If you think about the first thing you do in the morning, what you do, probably open up your mobile phone and take a look at that. So in a way you're already engaged in an online activity. And when you take a look at, for instance, you know, all of the various kinds of social media or tools or applications you use, there's a good chance that when you add it all up, you're probably spending many more hours on these platforms than perhaps maybe even with some of your physical interactions. And when you take a look at the gaming industry as a whole, actually most of the world is already playing games on a regular basis and they're existing in a kind of metaverse. So you could actually argue that we are existing in a pre-metaverse world today already, where perhaps most of our time is spent online. But the key question around what the real metaverse comes to is actually who owns this metaverse? And who owns your digital life? And actually what happens to all the data that is generated there? Which brings me to the next point, and perhaps one of the most important things about how we define the open metaverse, which is that the most valuable of resources on earth today isn't actually oil or natural resources that you dig from the ground. It is in fact data. When you consider, for instance, the kind of influence that the large platforms are able to generate from the data, it comes from the fact that we're the generators of this data. The world's most valuable resource is in fact coming from each and every one of us. We're the creators of this data right now. And they come from our time and our idea space. Every time we use Facebook, Every time we use WeChat, every time we use any online service in the world, we think that we're there for free and we enjoy the benefits for free. But in reality, we're giving our time and therefore our data. And what in fact do you own when you're in those spaces? In fact, what happens is, is that you don't own anything because your time and data is being spent online. And then actually these blocks of information are turned into knowledge through the massive network effect that is being generated because data by itself is not very valuable to us today. I could download all my photos and it would be interesting, but I don't know what to do with it. It's not that different. If a thousand years ago we were discovering oil in a property, we wouldn't know what to do with it. It's not very valuable in and of itself. But because of technology, we can actually take the oil and turn it into a valuable fuel that can be used in things like cars and other industries. And therefore that is valuable. We've created the machinery to create some benefit out of the oil. With data, it's the same. We can have all the data in the world ourselves, but we lack the ability to turn the data into valuable network effects. This is basically what companies like Facebook, or Tencent, or Amazon, or all those companies are able to take our data. And what's interesting is that when they generate that data, which we give to them for free, they create the powerful network effect that they then sell back to us in the form of advertising, and other sorts of services that we ourselves perhaps don't fully appreciate, but they may know even more about us than we know ourselves because we willingly give up our data. And the result of that, of course, is that the biggest companies in the world today are all data-rich companies. You know, whether this is Google, whether this is Microsoft, whether this is Apple, these are the kind of companies today 
that have control of our data and as we use it every day, make the platforms more wealthy. In contrast to when you take a look at, you know, some 10, 20 years ago, the biggest companies were not technology companies because they didn't have the data as a resource. It was in fact actually, you know, the other kind of resource, which is mostly oil and energy back in the day. And so what we have today is a kind of, you know, pre-metaverse world, if you will, that is basically controlled by these data silos, these digital kingdoms, you know, whether this is you know, Microsoft or Facebook or Google or Tencent, you know, these amazing companies that have done really, really well. But what has made them powerful is the fact that we have given them the data and they've created these silos. And the silos, the data ownership, and the network effect of the data they generate is actually how they control their particular metaverses. So when Facebook talks about, you know, creating the metaverse, they're talking about a metaverse that actually is controlled entirely within them and within their particular wall garden where we have no rights. And the issue, of course, is that when we don't have rights, we run into other issues, which is a growing scenario where we don't actually have property rights and essentially a growing inequity, which becomes a problem, particularly because the time that we spend online ought to belong to us. And in fact, in the real metaverse, we should own our time, we should own our digital property rights, which I'll get to shortly. So this is why technology such as blockchain, Web3 and the metaverse we think is so powerful. Because actually what the blockchain allows us to do is that for the first time, we can actually truly own in a decentralized fashion, our digital property. Meaning whether I own a virtual house, a virtual car, a virtual sword, these are actual assets in and of itself that we can actually utilize. And these are things that belong to us because the blockchain essentially acts as the mechanism in which digital assets can freely be interchanged and known who actually are the owners of these particular assets. And perhaps one of the more interesting things is that the technology of non-fungible tokens is actually the mechanism in which we can own digital things, digital properties in the metaverse in a truly scalable fashion. Let me explain that a little bit in some fashion. Non-fungible tokens themselves mm -hmm. actually are the representation of property rights. What we mean by that is that actually with an NFT, you can, for instance, have the ownership of a person, you know, virtual land or virtual property or virtual asset. And that actually is maintained in the contract structure of the NFT. The important thing to understand here is that NFTs are composable, meaning that just like real property, you can start building experiences on top of it. But the important thing here is that you need a ledger, a mechanism that proves that ownership so that it can be transferred onwards to other people or it can be built on top of, which I'll explain to you a little bit later. So in ancient history, when you look at this, this is a Kuduro stone. Even in the oldest of times, you know, when people were building their first societies, and this one is you know, over 4,000 years old, for instance, people were already creating ways in which they could memorialize their property ownership, not just so they could pass it on to the next generation, but because people wanted certainty that they can own this asset. And back in the days, you know, the kings in ancient Babylon created these Kuduro stones as a way to guarantee the fact that people had a property of a piece of land that they could use and they could then either sell or rent it out, for instance, to others. And so this idea of the lasting societies or a good society is the one that actually had, you know, a form in which we could respect our property rights as we have in most modern societies. But why is this important? Well, one of the most important things here is an example here that I'm putting out for it, which is the invention of the very first horseless carriage, which is essentially the modern day car created by Daimler in basically, uh, you know, I think roughly 1886. And what was interesting about the creation of this car was that it, it actually spawned a massive industry because afterwards many other people started making cars that were of course more modern and faster. But you know, a hundred and you know, some years ago when the first car was actually created, little did Damon probably imagine that his invention would spark the kind of revolution that would basically create a platform for car wash companies, for Didi, for Lyft, for audio companies, you know, for tire companies, for actually thousands of different kinds of businesses 
that were actually created simply because you could have ownership, um, simply because you could build on top of the ownership of cars. And actually the structure that made this possible isn't a technological structure. It isn't the fact that the car could move. Yes, it was an interesting invention, of course, and very valuable. It was the fact that people had decentralized ownership of cars, that people can now build new experiences and services on top of these car industries because you could own those cars. And it is the property rights of these cars that allow for the formation of this. Because if you actually couldn't own a car, then something like Uber or Lyft or Didi couldn't work. If I actually weren't able to own a car, I could actually not purchase a car. There would be no brokerage. There would be no car dealership. There would be no agencies that would sell kind of cars. And there would be no constructions for those type of services. So meaning that the decentralized ownership of all property is one of the fundamental reasons why innovation can happen at the top. Non-fungible tokens can do similar things in a digital context. It is not just the ability to construct experiences that are physical, as we have seen in the physical world, that create essentially all these new job opportunities that are far greater than the car industry itself. But also in the digital context, you can do the same thing. You can add new experiences and new network effects on top of the ownership of other people's assets in the metaverse. So an example, for instance, would be that in an open metaverse, your virtual items inside your favorite game can be you know, used in 10 different games. It could be used in you know, different mechanisms. It could be used in a virtual museum. It can be used in whatever ways that someone else decides to do so. No different than if you own a car and you can have a car wash, for instance. You know, it's a service that is valuable for the owner of the car. And he does not seek, need to seek permission from Tesla or Volkswagen to be actually able to use the car wash. He just goes there and basically uses the car wash and an industry of car wash companies can emerge. In the metaverse, this is already popularized in different concepts, like for instance, the idea of virtual lab. Just like you have physical property, uh, you can have you know, real estate brokers, you can have agents, you can have furniture designers, you can have people who make new experiences, you can have people who make you know, beautiful things, nice new kitchens inside the physical property in the virtual uh, real estate that exists in things like Sandbox, you can do the same. We can basically own your virtual land. And today, actually, the Sandbox is perhaps one of the best examples in which you can actually own a piece of the metaverse, or you can basically build and develop on top of it. And of course, what you're actually owning are these digital assets, these NFTs, that provide a way for you to store your culture, very similar to a wedding ring. You know, the wedding ring in itself is not terribly valuable, but it is very special to you because it embeds with it your personal culture or the culture of your family. And these are things we can now do and store digitally, something that we couldn't do before because we always needed to seek permission. And one of the other amazing things that's already happened in this space is the ability to actually create new jobs and new opportunities. So for instance, in this phenomenon with play to earn, because you have digital property rights, people were basically creating ways in which you could rent the assets. And these assets could then be rented to players in places like the Philippines or Venezuela or Indonesia, who then create jobs out of the ability to generate new metaverse employment, essentially in games like you know, Axe Infinity, or maybe even the Sandbox, or Rev Racing, and so on. Right? And they're actually making real incomes from this, and it's changing their lives and bringing them out of, bringing them very much uh, out of, out of you know, poverty, especially during times of COVID where they can actually get job employment. So I want to give you an example here as uh, you know, uh, a demonstration of you know, an example of the kind of person who is working in the metaverse. And you can see that he's not actually playing one kind of sort of um, metaverse game. He's actually playing many different games and making an income and yield optimizing. And what's interesting is, is that it's actually not that different when you think of it as a gig economy worker who basically might be a teacher during the day, might be a driver in the afternoon, or you know, basically more taking multiple jobs. In the metaverse, he can take multiple jobs too, except he can actually do it all roughly at the same time because of the fact that it's all virtual. He no longer has to move around. And more and more people are optimizing their virtual metaverse time that way. So um, I think, you know, quickly to conclude kind of where we are roughly in the state of the metaverse, you know, the world of the metaverse, or the open metaverse, which is what we think is the true metaverse, the one that I just described earlier, where you have true digital property rights, is still very early in its development. We would say that we're roughly, you know, kind of where the internet was 
around, say, 2001, maybe 2002. And, you know, those numbers have grown since. But, you know, about half a year ago, you had roughly 10 million MetaMask active users. And today, you have about uh, 10 million PayPal accounts. You know, but if you consider the size of the where the internet is, which is 4.6 billion users, and you have like 3.24 billion gamers out there, you know, and you still only have tens of millions of people that are actually currently using, you know, and are engaged in the um, uh, sort of open metaverse, we still have a long way to go in terms of growth. So we think the opportunity could continue to become quite substantial. But the fundamental in all of this, this is based on this, which is that the true and open metaverse can only be one where you can have real property rights. Because if you don't have property rights, you can actually compose experiences on top of it. You can innovate on top of it. You, create, you can actually create a real lasting society without actually owning the property in the metaverse. That's why as a fundamental, it is important that the real metaverse is the one in which you can have own properties. Metaverses that are promoted in such places like Facebook, for instance, that are closed ecosystems, do not guarantee you the right of the ownership of whatever you're building on top. And we've seen this before. You can build a great application on Facebook. You can build a great application on Apple. But actually what happens is when they change the rules, they take it all away and you lose your app or you lose your business. And in fact, you can't actually construct a stable long-term business when your property rights aren't guaranteed. So basically, in a nutshell, I would say that when you think of building and constructing this exciting new opportunity that is the metaverse, you know, things like VR and AR, these are all interfaces into the world of the metaverse. But the fundamental base layer, which we need to conscious, be conscious about as true citizens or future potential users of the metaverse is that we actually need to have a platform a mechanism in which our property rights are respected as they are in the real world. Thank you very much.